heard some marvelous talks today about the wonders of the human brain, and here I am to tell you at the end of the day that there is a major shortcoming in all of our brains, something I call linearity. I'll explain it in a little bit, I'll tell you what the implication is, but don't despair, I will finish with a process by which you can substantially overcome that limitation. Now we've heard about how the brain supports our personality, our decision-making processes, our creativity. There's one more that I forget. Oh yeah, memory. <laughs> gotcha. So what's the problem? We get fooled by our brain which extrapolates data linearly. It assumes that we've had a nice rise that continues rising at the same slope. Doesn't fit the real world of compound growth where things like fossil fuel con uh, consumption grows compounded, where water use grows compounded, where the stuff we put into the rivers and into the air is growing at a compound rate. And so we wind up with wildly inaccurate long-term plans and, and who cares? Why do you care about the long-term? Well, for you students, that's where you're gonna live. And I'm here to tell you that you can do a much better job than my generation has done in dealing with some of these issues. Now, you guys think you invented the concept of networking, but we seniors have been doing it long before you invented uh, tweeters and fast Facebook, uh, his book, her book, your book, my book, our book, their book, our book. So I called my old friend Albert Einstein, and I said, Albert, I'm working on a future projection for a bunch of young people. Can you help me get a perspective on what's the strongest force in the universe. Ah, it was just kind of an icebreaker. I mean, everybody knows what Albert Einstein is gonna say, right? Nuclear fission, atomic bombs, hydrogen bombs. He comes back to me and says, compound interest. I said, Albert, compound interest? What are you talking about? He says, yeah, I'm still working on my student loans. <laughs> Well, I thought it was a no-brainer, but I guess I'm the one with no brain, not even a linear one. In my classes, when my students present their problem statements, I go up to the board and write as big as letters as I can, SWWC, so what, who cares? Well, who cares about our inability to look properly into the future? We all should. It influences things like financial decisions, our energy and environmental problems come from a lack of will or a lack of capability of, of dealing with them. You know, there used to be something called pension plans. Any of the students want to have me define it for them afterwards, I will, but it doesn't make any difference. They don't exist anymore. There is Social Security at this stage, which I hope is going to be around for a while. We also can get into some health problems. You know, we uh, heard about measles. Well, a couple of kids get the measles, what's the point? Two kids give it to four who give it to 10. Ebola, wasn't that just in Africa? No, one, two, four, 10, pretty soon United States and other countries. So we need to be able to deal with this problem. Now I call a yardstick or a ruler or a straight edge an instrument of the devil. Notice even his pitchfork is a straight line. We get a couple of data points there. Draw the hard green line we kind of bend the straight edge around a little bit and sort of make it fit. And then we extrapolate to the end of the screen, to the end of our computers, get a big enough piece of paper, we extrapolate for 50 years. That's what we assume. Here's what really happens. With compound growth, we start with a base, we add a percentage, that makes the base a little bigger. The next percentage is on a bigger base, which makes the delta a little bigger which adds into a bigger base, and it keeps on going until we wind up with what the venture capitalists call a hockey stick. You know how hockey sticks are shaped? It goes like that. Now, you look at those lines, and you're going to say, each one of them that made up my curve looks linear. Yeah, because that's how I cre created them. But that's what our brain does. We look at short-term data. You know, did the climate change in Chicago since yesterday? Have you gained any weight since last Wednesday? Well, some important things that grow on a compound basis are shown here. Population is probably the most important, and it influences all the rest of them. Energy consumption. More people consuming more energy, but it's worse than that. As our economies improve, we get more labor-saving devices, and pretty soon the people in the third world start to say, hey, those guys got TVs and automobiles and motor scooters and computers, lights. 
we want to have the same sort of thing. So energy consumption starts to take off. Water consumption takes off as part of the energy production process, the refining process, and we drink and cook and bathe in it and look at the pictures from California if you want to see what's happened to an agricultural industry. The governor's stopping uh, reducing water consumption by 25%. Mother Nature is probably going to do 50%. The pollution of natural resources, where people are drinking water with dead animals floating by, where people can't go to school because they can't see across the street because of the particulate matter in the air. Well, I talked to a couple of students at one of the breaks, and they said they hoped I would give them a math problem. And as a professor, I guess I'm required to do that. And I thought I would use an example of the loan shark. Now, you know what these is? These are the guys that stand on a street corner with a wad of money, and he lends money at the short term at outrageous interest rates to poor people, like 20% a week. Now, the sharks don't actually look like that. Well, actually, they do. But imagine me, a poor factory worker, walking home, and I'm supposed to stop and pick up some milk at the grocery store for the kids. And I look in my pocket, and I got 50, 75, 85 cents. You're not going to get much milk for 85 cents. Well, this guy looks kind of friendly, so I go over and shake his hand, and I say, hey, partner, can I get $5 till next week? He says, oh, absolutely. <clears throat> Do I have to sign anything? No, oh, I recognize you. You'll be back. Oh, that's pretty good. Bring $6 when you come back. So I say, $1 service charge? That's not so bad. But I come back next week, and my pockets are just as bare. And he says, that's no problem. We have something we call the rollover. So we just roll over the bill, and next week you owe me $7.20. Shakes hands, and we part. If this continues for a year, the last time he shakes your hand, he's not smiling, and your hand is no longer connected to your body, and you owe him $65,000. That's the linearity that your brain cannot comprehend, the, the exponentiation of that, that you cannot comprehend. Now, if this is a little bit too extreme for you guys, go home and take a look at your credit card balance. Ah, I, I originally said 24%, and my wife said, I think that's too high. We got a letter from one of the department stores that says, we're raising your credit card balance to 27, or your interest to 27.9%. 24% doubles in three years. If you're carrying a $1,000 balance in three years, it's 2,000, three more years, it's 4,000. You ain't ever gonna get out of that vicious circle. Well, in this overcrowded world, I told you, people are starting to get wise. They don't want to have to go to bed when the sun goes down. They want their kids to be able to do homework. When the weather gets hot and sticky, it's nice to have a fan to move some wind around a little bit. And instead of walking to town or riding an animal, it would be nice to have a motorbike or a motor scooter. Well, if we take population growth and we take per capita energy consumption growth, it comes out to around 5 or 6%. You pick your number. Do that for 50 years, and it comes out to 15x. What's 15x? If we generate and use x amount of energy today, in 50 years, we'll be using 15x. I've spent more than 50 years in the petroleum refining business. I have no clue how to do that. So if anybody knows, please stop me afterwards. I'd love to hear it. Now, many of you students are saying, well, I'm as old as this guy. My dream is to have a really nice car. And that was always my dream, have a nice Lexus hybrid. And I think that's realistic for you guys. But let's look into 2065 and see what that Lexus hybrid looks like. <laughs> uh, and there it is. Now, I'm pleased to see, you know, my hybrid has a gasoline engine and an electric motor. This one has a camel and a bicycle. Now, that used to be a forest before you guys cut down all the trees, but now it's a desert. And camels are really good for walking across the desert. But when you get to town, it's kind of crowded. That's why you got the bicycle. So you got to park the camel. And where are you going to park your camel? In the camel lot. <laughs> so, you, <laughs> even I'm ashamed of that one. <laughs> but you got to hurry back and get on the camel because your ki grandkids are waiting to ask you questions about your career. Now, Fresh graduates from college are not going to be driving a Lexus. The day after I graduated from IIT, I bought a Volkswagen. And over the years, I gradually increased the size and the luxury of the cars that I had. So your grandkids are going to have a Volkswagen, too. And there's the 2065 model. And they said, Grandfather, 
what is this automobile business that you're talking about? He says, well, it's very much like your donkey. Donkey's got four legs, the automobile had four wheels. You want to steer the donkey, you pull the reins to the right or the left, we well, turn the steering wheel to the right or the left. Uh, is that a seat? Your donkey has a seat. Almost the same thing, except we had windows and doors and a radio. So the kid says, so what's that stuff that was called gasoline? Well, we had to provide a source of energy for the car to move. It's like your donkey. You got to give him some grass or some oats or some hay for him to be able to move. I'm not sure what camels eat, but I don't think it's gasoline. Is that how you got to the United States, Grandpa? We know you worked on solar energy and wind power and so forth. He said, no, actually, that's where the next generation, how the next generation is going to come to the United States. Fortunately, Christopher Columbus kept the drawings of his ships. And what was good enough in 1492 will be good enough for your grandkids in 2092. Well, those are the problems. How are we going to get to the solution? I like to use little puzzles and little games to teach. Everybody knows what a lily pad is, the little flat leaves with a pretty white flower on there. This is the lily pad puzzle. This picture of my lake is not the scale. My lake is actually really, really big. I'm surprised you haven't heard of it. It's called Anderson Lake. And I buy a, a lily pad which doubles every year. So at the end of the first year, it's twice as big. The next year, it's four times as big. I measure the acreage of this, this lake. And it is so big that it'll take 100 years at that growth rate to completely cover the lake. And so the question to my students is, at what point in that 100 years will the lake be 50% covered? Think about it. If you say 50 years, no, that's linear. What do you think, 60, 70? Anybody taking 80? Do I hear 99? Okay, the gentleman 99 wins because at 99 years the lake is half covered and two times a half is one, so next year it's 100% covered. Our brains don't see that. Our brains don't think that way. Here's another one that is particularly useful in my classrooms. Students are always interested in getting an A. And when I tell them the hard way, which is to study and come to class and do your homework and write a good paper, there's always somebody that says, isn't there kind of a uh, fiduciary way of kind of lubricating this process? And I said, well, you know, the university frowns on students bribing professors, and they frown even more on professors accepting bribes. So let me just talk about a hypothetical situation. I'm, a, I'm not a greedy guy. You all play chess or checkers. You know 64 squares on the chessboard. So you put a penny on the first square, and then two, and then four. And when you get that thing finished, bring it to me, and I'll give you the A. What would you guess is the final number? My students say $1,000, a $1 million, $6 billion, $27 trillion. I had to look at my hard drive with kilo, mega, giga, blah, 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 and it still isn't big. It's 10 to the 17th dollars. So far, nobody has made that offer. So my ethics are still intact. <laughs> well, we've defined the problem. Let's talk about some solutions. We need to take a longer time frame for major decisions. I worked in a startup company one time where long-term decisions were, what should we do for lunch? When I talk about long-term, I'm talking 10, 20, 30, 40 years, during which time you have to think about what else is going to be changing, not just the phenomenon that you're analyzing. Number two, be a detective. Look for historic data on actual growth rates. Don't accept conventional wisdom that it was linear. Dig down, burrow down, find out what's really making it happen. In my experience, anything that's worth worrying about is compounding. Do a sensitivity analysis on different growth rates. This is really easy. You go to the sixth key on your uh, computer keyboard, the uppercase thing is that little carrot which exponentiates. You put in your interest rate times whatever number of years and the answer pops up. You can get a real flavor of how much out of control can this get. So you do the best job you can and then you monitor reality. You're never going to get it right the first time. It might be too high, it might be too low. Figure out why and make an adjustment. It's like the GPS on my car. It tells me to make a turn and when I don't do it, this annoying voice says, well, I fixed that. I turned it off. Now, my wife said, 
wouldn't it be easier just to follow the directions? She always says that. So what's at risk? Our way of life? Economic well-being? Our economic futures? Happy retirement? Our health? Political stability of the world. When we run out of oil and water, you know, Mark Twain said, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting over. I don't want to envision a situation where we've got a world war over these kinds of resources. And I believe we have a moral and ethical obligation to those people who live in these developing countries that they should share some of the nice lifestyle improvements that we have had, some of the labor-saving devices and so forth, and we can't do that if we don't start doing something about this now. What can we do? You folks have scientific or technical, mathematical, financial backgrounds. We can start educating our kids. We can talk to our politicians. We can help our friends and neighbors understand these things. In the words of Steve Jobs, 1997, he said to the Apple employees and customers, think different. And that's what we have to do, because if we fail in this effort, everybody loses. Thank you.